Uh, there are a couple of meetings at the moment, relevant meetings at the moment, but we are very happy to have uh, our guests, Roberto, he's well known, him Federico II delle Donne, Emily Frenkel, Sabine St. Rose, who will be sharing this panel on open science and participatory democracy. Thank you very much, Sabine, to you the floor. Thank you. And thank you all for coming back, despite uh, the wonderful weather and the fantastic coffee and pastries next door. I am very excited to be facilitating this panel because this is a subject that is very dear to my heart and also at the core of Aurora. So I will uh, not waste more time and I will introduce our panelists and I'm very glad uh, that they could be available and speak to you today because I got really excited just preparing for this uh, panel. So I'm sure you will appreciate that as well. And uh, my first panelist is Emilie, Emilie Frenkiel, who is Associate Professor in Political Science at UPEC, our new colleagues uh, uh, from Paris Est. She is also the Vice Director of the Political Studies Institute in Fontainebleau, part of UPEC. Vice Director of the LIPA Research Lab. You're also a university assessor in charge of participatory devices, and you'll tell us more about that. And uh, you're an esteemed member of the Aurora uh, Values Task Team as well. So welcome to you, Emily. And then on my right, I have Roberto, Roberto Della Donne. You are a full professor in medieval history and, and this is an interesting one, methodology and history of historiography at the University of Naples here. Very interesting subject. And you coordinate the PhD program in historical sciences. And for the somewhat like 20 years, you have combined your interest in history and digital humanities with an active role in promoting open science, coordinating the open science observatory of the Italian University's Rector's Conference. And since January last year, you have been a member of the European University Association's expert group on open science. So, can you please give a warm uh, applause to our dear colleagues? Thank you very much. So, first we're going to dive a bit more in those uh, terms and realities. What is, and I will start with you, Emily, uh, what is participatory democracy, and uh, why is it important? Thank you so much, Sabine, uh, for um, having me here. I'm, I'm really honored uh, to be speaking in front of you today. Um, so, um, yeah, it is working. Um, so, here, I want to uh, talk about citizen participation, but a specific kind, uh, or maybe a slightly more, or actually more demanding type of participation, which is deliberative uh, part participation in a sense, or uh, collective deliberation. So what do I mean uh, by that? Uh, I mean that uh, when we ask people to participate, when we create participatory devices, what we do, is we complement the existing representative democracy, where people get to vote for people who make the decision. Uh, now, in a participatory system or a process, then anyone um, can join in the, in the, the decision-making process. So it's, it's, a, it's a great challenge. It, it's a part of what we call democratizing democracy. I mean, it's very important in the European context. You know, this is one of the um, distinct uh, European feature, right, in our, that we find in our, in our political systems, right, democracy. We still encounter many problems, including with our representative democracies. That's why we still need to call for people to vote in the next elections. Um, these initiatives to democratize democracy are um, a potential solution to actually make uh, people want to participate through voting, but also, also through other processes. The difference between participation, well, citizen participation and citizen deliberation is 
that, or well, maybe I was too close, it's probably better now. Um, the difference is that we are insisting on the, the fact that participants are equal. When we ask everyone to participate, where people come with their differences, different um, uh, educational background, uh, different feelings of legitimacy and so on. In a deliberative process, we ensure, we put people in specific conditions for them to feel that they have something to say. We train them more specifically. Uh, we ensure that our other people are listening uh, to what they're saying. Uh, so it's a way to involve, I'm reading the last part here, a way to involve people that are not generally part of the decision-making process, whether by rational ignorance or logistical difficulties. And we're not, uh, we're creating a counterfactual situation. For me, public, uh, uh, it's counterfactual because it's a situation of what if. What if the European uh, citizens were all voting, but that they had time to reflect, to actually know what the question is, uh, to understand the impact of their decision, to understand the impact of voting for one person and on another on their interests, but also on the interests of their communities and the children, the countries. Um, so uh, one, um, quite popular deliberative device uh, in the last decade has been citizens' assemblies. And you've probably heard of the climate citizens' assemblies. Uh, and um, in these situations where we, uh, we create a mini public, bodies of people, uh, where, where people uh, will deliberate uh, on what to do. Right, and they will deliberate on very complex issues. So they are selected. Um, it's, it's creating, we're creating a, a, a mini public of people who are a microcosm of the national population. And um, the, the idea is that people listen to each other. They are trained, they have a basic knowledge, and they share their experiences and their points of views. They all treat each other as equals, and they are led to be flexible. That is, they come with their opinions that might not be all fully formed uh, at the very beginning. At, after a, um, a few days, uh, then they will have developed a full-fledged opinion, which might be slightly different from the opinion that they had at the start. So why is it important it's very important because we have very important decisions to make and very hard, hard decisions, especially regarding the environment. Um, we're really at a crossroads now uh, and the planet as we need it as humans to live, you know, the, 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 um, might just collapse if we're not making very strong and hard decisions in the next few weeks. Uh, so, um, we know that, and Europeans know that, and at the same time, it's terribly difficult to impose uh, what many people judge uh, sacrifices, you know, uh, on, on the level European uh, population. So, we need to decide together. And so, that's why uh, participatory democracy deliberative democracy is important. When we have terribly hard decisions to make, when we have uh, incredibly complex situations to understand uh, that will affect people in different ways, we have to put people in the same room to discuss things and understand you know, what actions can take place that are acceptable for different kinds of people. So that's what I'm going to talk uh, about. Thanks to Sabine. <laughs> Thank you very much, Emily. Now, if we can change um, slides, I will give the floor to Roberto with basically the same question. What is, uh, is it working? What is citizen science? What is the difference with open science, by the way? 
and uh, why is it important for society and for Aurora? Okay, uh, citizen science as part, it is working, yeah? No. No. Uh, citizen science as part of the broader open science movement involves public participation and collaboration in scientific research with the aim to increasing scientific knowledge. Open science is a concept that encompasses various practice, uh, practices aimed at making science more transparent, accessible, and useful for everyone. It includes open access to publications, the open data, and the involvement of the public and other non-professional scientists in the research process. Citizen science plays a crucial role in this framework by enabling non-professional scientists or the general public to participate in the scientific process. This can include activities like collecting data, analyzing information, or sharing observations with professional scientists. Such collaboration can occur in many disciplines, ranging from astronomy to environmental science, biology, social sciences, and humanities. The benefits of integrating citizen science into open science are manifold. Firstly, it democratizes science by breaking down the barriers to access and participation. This not only helps uh, in engaging a, broad and, a broader audience, but also taps into a diverse pool of ideas and experiences that can enhance scientific outcomes. Secondly, it can lead to large-scale data collection at a lower cost, making it feasible to undertake studies that might otherwise be too expensive or logistically complex. Next slide. Uh, moreover, Citizen science uh, fosters a greater public understanding of science and enhances public trust in scientific processes and findings. When people are directly involved in scientific endeavors, they are more likely to understand and accept the conclusions de derived from such research. Next. Uh, digital platforms often facilitate these contributions, enabling widespread participation and collaboration between professional sciences and the public. This inclusive method, method accelerates research, diversifies knowledge, and promotes a broader understanding and engagement in science and culture. Next one. In the humanities, projects might involve transcribing historical documents, categorizing archival materials, or contributing to digital art collections which can enhance cultural heritage, understanding, and preservation. By engaging with these scientific processes, communities learn to view their cultural identities and heritage through a less dogmatic and more nuanced lens. This understanding encourages a more complex appreciation of their cultural heritage, fostering dialogue among uh, diverse identity narratives within the same community. Such dialogue can lead to greater mutual understanding and a deeper shared recognition of the rich and multifaceted nature of cultural contexts. Next. In summary, citizen science is a vital component of open science, contributing to scientific research by involving non-professional scientists in meaningful ways, democratizing access to science, 
and enhancing public engagement and education. This collaboration not only supports scientific research, but also promotes an informed citizenry, which is essential in addressing complex global challenges. Okay. UNESCO and other international bodies offer, uh, offer insights or policy papers on the role of citizen science in achieving sustainable development goals or in global science governance. European and international institutions have been actively supporting citizen science, recognizing its value in engaging the public in scientific research and fostering innovation. For instance, European Union's Horizon 2020 program has integrated citizen science within its Green Deal projects, examining how these initiatives can be incorporated into broader research and innovation strategies. Moreover, the European Union has established the Citizen Science Prize, managed by Ars Electronica, to recognize outstanding projects that contribute to a diverse, inclusive, and sustainable society. The Time for Citizen Science Project, funded by the European Union, also exemplifies support for citizen science by focusing on embedding citizen science within research performing organizations. These initiatives demonstrate a robust effort to promote citizen science not only as a, a tool for data collection, but also as a crucial component of social innovation and public engagement in science. Next, next one, last one. Uh, here are some notable citizen science initiatives in Europe. I can go analytically in all of them, but of course, if, uh, some question will come later, I can do that. I stop for now. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, so the clap. Thank you very much uh, to both of you for putting together this conceptual framework and giving some, some examples. This is, this is excellent. Um, I uh, would like to touch now a bit more uh, on the, the added value and uh, the European level, because um, as a citizen, I have participated in some projects in citizen science uh, when I was basically counting wildlife with my family when living in the Alps. Or I have also been in several panels uh, uh, linked to my local city council on some developments. So as a citizen, I can really relate uh, uh, with those approaches. But now, what about Aurora? What Aurora and also our European level, uh, quite far away from my little Alps, let's say, uh, can bring to those approaches and uh, what um, can uh, we benefit from and what is uh, the, the practice going to be looking like at this European level. And, but just for, for a quick... Um, a quick feel of the room. How many of you have participated in such initiatives? <laughs> Counting birds or wildlife, being in some panels? Yes, a few of you. Ah, well, now more courageous people are raising their hands. And how many of you, keep your hands raised, please. Thank you, so that we can look at you and admire you. How many of you uh, do think that there is added value at European level? Uh, even more, okay. Well, that's nice, you have. Uh, conquered the room, as we would say in French. So please, can you, can you tell us more on your views on this point? Sorry, yes, on the yeah, yeah, the, 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 okay. Do you want it, or? The next one, the next one. Thank you, thank you. Well, um, a European University Alliance, like Aurora, which focuses on innovation, research, and education, across multiple universities in Europe has a mutually beneficial relationship with citizen science. 
the first question, so to say, what citizen science brings to Aurora? Uh, citizen science can provide researchers within the Aurora Alliance access to a broader range of data collected by citizens across different regions. This data is particularly valuable in fields like environmental science, epidemiology, and sociology, where large scale, scale data collection is essential. By involving citizens in research projects, Aurora can enhance science education and literacy among the general public. This not only educates people about scientific methods, but also raises awareness about the research topics Aurora focuses on, focuses on, such as sustainability and social innovation. Citizen science often involves innovative data collection and analysis methods, utilizing tools like mobile apps and online platforms. Incorporating those methodologies can inspire new research techniques and technologies within Aurora. Engaging a diverse range of participants through citizen science initiatives can bring different perspectives and ideas into academic research, which might lead to new insights and break tools that a more homogeneous academic group might miss. What Aurora brings to citizen science, uh, I would say, next slide, scientific rigor. Aurora can provide the necessary expertise to ensure that the data collected through citizen science projects is valid reliable, and scientifically rigorous. The, uh, this improves the quality of the research outputs and their acceptability in academic uh, circles. Uh, scalability. Um, with its network of universities and resources, Aurora can help scale citizen science projects beyond local and national or national levels to a broader European and even global audience. This scalability can significantly enhance the impact of the research findings. Interdisciplinary collaboration. Aurora's interdisciplinary environment can facilitate collaborations ac across different fields of study enriching citizen science projects with various academic perspectives and methodologies. Aurora's position in the European academic and political landscape can help elevate the profile of citizen science data and findings, influencing policy decisions at higher levels. Aurora can provide the necessary funding, infrastructure, and technology support to sustain and expand citizen science initiatives, which are often limited by resource constraints. In conclusion, the synergy between Aurora and citizen science can lead to a more engaged public enhanced scientific research and the development of innovative solutions to complex challenges. This relationship not only advances Aurora's missions, uh, mission, but also promotes a broader culture of scientific curiosity and public participation in scientific endeavors. Uh, I that's already a, a lot, actually. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. This is, this is very interesting to have your uh, perspective. But would you say there are so many advantages uh, to such synergies for uh, participatory democracy as well? Or um, I would much. certainly say so. So yeah. what's interesting is that participatory democracy hasn't been so um, integrated into our universities yet. And yet, there's a fantastic potential in doing that. 
And so that's what I will try to, uh, to convince you of. So here you can see that these uh, climate assemblies are mainly taking place in Europe already, but they are taking place outside of universities. And we're only a few universities who are now organizing our own uh, citizens' assemblies involving students especially. But what's interesting is that in these assemblies, we get different people together to make decisions. And uh, I think it's, it's very important for our universities to also form very strong communities within our universities. So having students working together, no matter the topics that they are studying, no matter their level, um, no matter the, the career they have in mind, uh, in their minds, uh, but also getting uh, them to work uh, with uh, the other communities in our university, that is with their teachers, with researchers, with the administration, without which the university doesn't hold together. All of these people have to work together and make these decisions, these hard decisions together at our level. And then also uh, um, expand to our partners. So Aurora, um, so we are already uh, doing this at ETEC. Um, we are now organizing our fourth edition of a Citizens' Assembly. It's involving uh, more than 400 students with uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of guests as well, and a lot of local governments, and, and also some uh, French ministries are involved. Uh, and the idea is uh, for us to update the way we teach, the way we conduct research, the way the university functions as well, right? And there is a task team on, on the green and uh, campuses uh, as well. And uh, I'm very proud to say that yesterday I took the train from Paris to uh, Napoli uh, and I didn't fly. And uh, I think these are practices that we could also try to encourage ourselves to, to do when we have time um, and, uh, and, and, and try to lower our carbon impacts. These there, universities can be pilots for some practices and, for, and, uh, and also in terms of decision-making process. And the idea is to become more sustainable, uh, but in a democratic uh, manner. So uh, we are already doing this at EPEC. Uh, we have uh, deliberated, so we are giving students many roles, not only as participants, but also as moderators of the debates and ambassadors, and, and also taking part of the, in the research that we're producing. This is the organizing team. Um, and we're also um, uh, selecting some to represent future generations, because that's the idea, right? The planet will remain, but are human beings uh, going to be able to live in it in, comfortable, in a comfortable way? Well, uh, maybe not, uh, if we're not changing our, uh, our practices. So the first uh, edition was on food, uh, the second one on a digital society, the third one on the future of the university with a, a, a specific attention to water and the, the commons. And so it's, it takes place over several months, a lot of preparation, then two months of deliberation, uh, offline in, in rooms, in very small groups of 10, but also thanks to a, an online uh, tool that is called Decidim. And uh, the idea is for students to uh, take um, part in the agenda setting, right? Identify some problems, some issues, identify some actions, um, getting to, to meet different types of people and then, you know, producing these proposals, producing some theater plays as well and some art, uh, and getting involved, um, getting, feeling empowered. And, uh, if you're interested, we have produced, uh, I mean, a filmmaker has produced a documentary film on what we, we have done. Um, and uh, I would like to uh, finish this on, on saying this is a very peculiar pedagogical and institutional experience. Everybody's um, changing position, right? Teachers are uh, no longer teaching. They're learning along with the students on different topics that are, might not be uh, their specialty, right? Their uh, comfort zone. Uh, they're learning how to live on, the, on this planet if the main issue is, you know, planetary boundaries and, and environmental protection. But we can also focus on different issues like inclusion um, and, uh, and uh, many other very uh, complicated topics. Uh, researchers are also, um, you know, 
sharing their research in a different way. Uh, uh, and uh, we're producing research on this as well. Uh, there's a lot of research on participatory democracy and, and deliberation. And here we're in a very different context and very interesting. Um, so uh, what's happening now is that we are more and more universities organizing this. There are some universities that are uh, not only putting students at the center, but are really mixing uh, students with the other university communities as well, with administrative staff and researchers uh, and, uh, and uh, teachers more. And there are now 19 members of our network of deliberating universities. One other university is uh, from Aurora, which is the Zoo uh, Vrij University in Amsterdam is also going to organize its uh, Student Citizens Assembly uh, uh, at the end of this year, I think. Um, I think we can bring this to Aurora. We would like to share this experience with you. We would like your universities to also try to introduce deliberation in your practices. It's not to replace the uh, current governance, it's to complement it in the way that you know, these uh, uh, processes have been invented to democratize democracy. We're trying to democratize the university democracy as well, uh, to make these hard decisions. For instance, you know, how can we encourage people to take the train more than fly, uh, even when we're going to Napoli? Um, and, and what kind of impact does it have? Um, and then how can this radiate outside of universities? So how can we have an impact all together within our universities, within our alliance? And then I think we can be much stronger if we're together. That's what Aurora can bring to our network, to our existing deliberations. If uh, more universities from Aurora participate to this, then we will uh, come up with more ideas. We will be able to implement uh, uh, actions that are going to be maybe more adapted to different situations. All European universities are not facing the same type of student population, not the same uh, territorial you know, uh, situations and so on. Um, so uh, if, uh, if the Aurora community uh, participates in a synchron synchronous uh, manner uh, to these uh, processes, then maybe we'll, we'll also have uh, more impact at the European and maybe global level. And just to, to finish on this, uh, there are now discussions that at the European level there are going to be youth citizens' assemblies, especially on the issue of biodiversity. And I think universities have to play a very strong role, not just as outside actors, you know, sending some cherry-picked researchers and so on. But I think we also have to experiment with this, uh, these processes, make them better together, and, and this can have a, a European and global impact. Perfect, thank you very much. <laughs> now, uh, allow me to be a bit controversial. Um, we have many colleagues that raised their hands, that said, yes, they are involved in such initiatives, but um, are, we, are we not just preaching to the converted? Is it just uh, this group, how representative uh, is it? And when I was visiting your institution, actually, uh, last January, I, I stopped in a, in a bookstore, um, love books from my language, uh, and I saw that there were, there were some publications exactly disputing uh, the, this very question of uh, participatory democracy and the fact that it was not a solution, uh, a replacement to uh, a solution to the difficulties that representative democracy was, uh, was knowing in our uh, countries in Europe and, and beyond. Uh, so what do you respond to that? Thank you, that's a very, very important question. Um, so um, there are two aspects I want to emphasize. Maybe I'll start with this one. Um, the problem that we have when we open the gates of uh, decision making with participation, uh, with participatory democracy, is that usually we get the usual suspects. Or in French, we say toujours les mêmes. It's always the same people who participate. So they are not uh, elected representatives, but they are the same. Uh, they are, 
too similar to the people who already get um, elected. That is, there are people who feel legitimate to speak, to speak uh, on behalf of others. There are people who are already informed, people who are already interested, people who are already concerned, people who already have time to devote to these issues and so on. But then we still don't get to listen to the others. And so that's the difference between participatory democracy and deliberative democracy. In deliberative devices, we go and try to find other people and we ensure, we put them in specific conditions for them to feel legitimate to speak. We give them a long training and time to develop uh, complex thinking on the complex issues. Uh, <clears throat> so that's, you know, one, I think that's uh, the, if we introduce not only participation, but deliberation in our universities, when then we are already meeting one of the challenge that you mentioned, uh, you know, one of the features of this challenge that, you know, it's not going to change the situation much. Uh, now, another source of uh, frustration related to participatory uh, democracy is that what we're doing is we're asking people to work. This is hard work, you know, taking part in a participatory or deliberative process is hard work. You work for months and then what happens? How impactful will that be? And that's the difference between consultation and, sorry, that's the difference between consultation and deliberation. It has to be binding. There have to be promises. You have to have an impact. So it doesn't mean that, for instance, at the level of universities, the presidents of the universities will say, whatever you decide, no matter what our uh, governance, you know, our representatives say, uh, we will do it. No, that can't work that way. But there has to be a very strong promise that what the students who participate produce, you know, and they uh, do it very thoughtfully, very carefully, um, then whatever they uh, propose will be discussed, will be listened to, if it cannot be implemented, it has to be justified and explained. Um, and I think through this type of you know, engagement, then we're already you know, meeting a second, a very important uh, challenge to participatory democracy. Now, uh, I would like to add uh, one last thing. Uh, I think that what is, has been uh, lacking as well in, many participatory devices compared to, you know, the step forward that we have in deliberative uh, processes is that we have the very strong emphasis on training. And I think that's why universities are one of the best places to actually uh, organize these processes. If you ask people to participate, but they don't get the extra training, they don't learn more, you know, and they, it, it's not enticing them to be even more curious about the world, uh, to be curious about uh, scientific results and respectful as well of the work of scientists, you know, uh, and, and of uh, um, cross-checked, fact-checked uh, science. And, and well, then we also fail our mission. So if you just, you know, ask people to participate they just answer very quickly, but they don't learn in the process, then you're not doing much better than in the current situation. Very good, thank you very much. Yes, another round of applause. <laughs> well, I hope uh, this has inspired uh, many colleagues in different universities, and uh, I know uh, from your talks with uh, our colleagues at the VU that this is really cross-fertilization and capitalizing on best practices. Uh, but now, if we look into uh, citizen science, Roberto, and, and before I, I give the floor to the, the room for more questions to you, can I ask you um, if some colleagues, um, academics, some project managers, staff members, uh, should consider uh, embarking uh, on citizen science projects? What what would be the challenges and what would be your recommendations to them? Uh, well, 
Embarking on citizen science projects uh, involves navigating a series of challenges that require careful consideration and strategic planning to avoid that they become big issues, we can say. Here in this slide uh, are some of the primary challenges that academics and project managers should address before starting such projects. First of all, ensuring data quality and integrity, uh, providing proper training and easy to use tools for participants is crucial for collecting reliable data. This might include detailed guidelines, training sessions, or intuitive apps that help standardize the data collection process. Implementing mechanisms for data validation, such as cross-checks or automated algorithms that flag outliers can help maintain the scientific integrity of the data co uh, uh, collected. Secondly, managing diverse participant expectations and expertise. Clearly communicate the goals of the project and what is expected from participants. This includes detailed instructions, the scope of their involvement and the impact of their contributions. Design the project to accommodate varying levels of skill and commitment. This might involve creating different roles or tasks that cater to both novice and experienced, uh, experienced participants. Thirdly, securing adequate funding. Accurately estimating the cost of tools, materials, training, and data management is essential. This helps in securing adequate funding to cover all aspects of the project. Exploring diverse, diverse funding sources, such as grants, partnerships with non-governmental organizations, or crowdfunding, can provide a more stable financial base. Four, number four, maintaining engagement and trust. Keeping participants engaged by providing regular updates about the project's progress and how their data is being used can foster a sense of ownership and satisfaction. Recognize recognizing the contributions of participants through acknowledgements in publications, celebratory events, or certificates can announce motivation and trust. Legal and ethical consideration, data privacy, we can say, ensuring that personal information is protected according to local and international data protection laws is critical. Participants should be informed about what data is being, is being collected, how it will be used, and who will have access to it. Clarifying how the results will be used and any intellectual property rights associated with project outputs is important. Participants should understand if and how the results might be commercialized. Technical infrastructure, now the number six, developing or utilizing robust platforms that can handle large volumes of data securely and efficiently is essential. This includes uh, considering data storage, backup procedures, and user support. Systems should be designed to scale up, accommodating an increasing number of participants or expanding geographically without compromising performance. Cultural and soci so social sensitivities 
projects should be designed with an awareness of cultural and social context, especially when involving diverse communities. This includes using appropriate language, respecting local norms, and addressing any potential social impacts. Last one, so to say, artificial intelligence should also be considered when planning and managing citizen science projects. Artificial intelligence can play a crucial role in addressing some of the key challenges and enhancing the capabilities of these initiatives. By carefully addressing these challenges, academics and project managers uh, can set a strong foundation for successful citizen science projects that not only contribute to scientific knowledge, but also engage the public in mean, meaningful ways. That is it. Thank you very much. I would like to give the, the floor to our colleagues and, and students as well on those uh, two very interesting topics uh, in general and also for Aurora. I think there is definitely possibilities for us to, to harness the powers of uh, those tools, those approaches uh, for our community. Is there, uh, we have some mics, are there some, some questions or comments? I see Pim raising his hand. Well, thank you very much for these uh, interesting, uh, very interesting uh, presentations and discussions. Indeed, a very hot topic. Um, for those who don't know me, uh, Pim de Boer, I'm working for the Aurora Central Office in Brussels. So I'm quite connected to the European Commission and the whole Brussels bubble. Um, and I mentioned this is a hot topic because for the next um, Europe, the European research uh, area, policy agenda, uh, let's say the rules of the game, how to deal with research and innovation, which includes um, trust in science. Um, we were already engaged as Aurora in the development of an area action on, um, uh, on citizens' in, in, in engagement and science for policy, uh, but also in trust in science, which is equally important or, mm -hmm. well, for citizens, even more important. So it is really important that Aurora gets engaged and uh, remains engaged in the era policy agenda because only in this way we are able to influence the policy makers at the national level and at the European level and via another era action also at the global level. Mm -hmm. Well, we are a global network, so yeah, please uh, keep in contact. Thank you very much, Pim, for, for this comment. Barbara? Barbara. So thank you for the mic. And uh, my name is Barbara Buchenau. I'm in charge of the joint education in Aurora. Um, and I was very fascinated by the two talks who actually talked to each other. And I want you to spell out one of those empty spots in between namely that the more contribution does not necessarily mean the more peace, but rather the more people are involved, the more do they demand to actually be listened to. Um, and I think you mentioned the fact that um, the communication of the many items in which I might have contributed, but then my point might be dropped, that that's a very crucial negotiation to be made. And I think both for the leaders that are now in charge and those who are trained to participate, I think we need a conversation about learning to, um, to voice for frustration, but also learning to um, accept that the more participation, citizen science is, as well, does not mean that there's more peace. Um, it actually means that people will have stronger demands on leverage, on being heard, on finding ch change really happening. So I think that's one of the things that I, 
am concerned with as we put the universities in contact with society. Thank you. Very good. It's about linking to your point of democratizing, democratizing democracy. Very hard to say. Do you want to comment on this? Sure. Um, thank you so much for this uh, for this very important question. Um, I, I agree that more uh, participation and more people being involved in the decision making uh, means more demands. I'm not sure it means less peace. Uh, why do I mean by that? Um, I mean that uh, if, if, for instance, we take the, the, the topic of end of life, you know, the second national citizens assembly in France uh, was not devoted to climate any longer, but on the end of life. You know, it's, that's a very controversial topic, and, and people with very strong religious uh, values, you know, came with very strong opinions, and the flexibility. Uh, was uh, very hard to get. In the end, uh, what political scientists like Yale professor Hélène Landmore um, observed, what they observed was that there was, a, there was a very strong community of you know, the participants. There was more than 180 participants. And even though there was a strong minority voices that were against what the majority of the participants were were proposing, uh, they all in the end uh, call themselves a strong community. And actually, Eden Landmore is now uh, writing a new book on the love, the loving relationship that develops when people actually get together for such a long time and form this kind of bubble of working together and respecting their differences and respecting their different opinions. And what's important in terms of design of the process is that in the end, when you get the final reports and the proposals, the majority could be just crushing the minority, right? But so what they have done in, for that, that specific situation was that in the final report, there were the uh, sort of more consensual proposals, but the minority proposals were also present in the report. And it was explained, you know, actually how many, uh, you know, what also the, the sort of quality, the content of their discussions, and how, what they were saying, even though they didn't win, right, the arguments, but how they actually enriched the conversation. And so I think that if we all, if we could, you know, sort of um, uh, propagate this type of process, right, and we all, at some point in our lives, and including our students, because they are students, and they, we organize this in universities, early in life, they learn this process of listening to each other, uh, even when we are, have very conflicting views, you know, and still going forward and coming with a result that is acceptable for everyone, then we, I think we, we could learn to live in a better society and a more peaceful society. Is it working? Yes. yes. Uh, well, yeah, I, I think, of course, uh, in the same way, that uh, engage the public in scientific research and data collection is uh, a challenge. And uh, it means that um, the different steps, the different um, uh, the different moments we have to go with require um, lots of uh, time and uh, concentration about uh, how to organize the work. Otherwise, uh, it won't, uh, uh, the results won't be uh, the expected ones. But there are some projects already realized in the European area, so to say, in different domains and disciplines that um, have been um, successful. You know? So, uh, of course, we have to try to learn uh, from this project you know, to uh, propose the, uh, the way, the methods they used uh, in other contexts. Uh, it requires lots of work, as we know. Every time that we try to engage, to engage non-professional in our uh, research practices, 
But in some cases, when we have to collect, to collect big amount of data, and we can define, so to say, the instruments that they have to be used, uh, a simple one, no, not too much difficult to use for, for at least not after a proper instruction period, uh, then you can get some result. So I'm always a little bit optimistic, but that's it. Thank you very much. Another question, oh, two, ooh, three. This inspiring talk is really inspiring. That's great. Uh, well, uh, Pasquale Celito from UPEC University uh, was also thinking, was maybe linked to what Barbara said before, so another risk of uh, citizen science. So um, Roberto uh, discussed many ways of participating. So one is data collection. It still is risky because you have to validate data. So I did something in this field as an atmospheric scientist. And yeah, you need to validate data. But there's another kind of participation, which is the interpretation of data. So I mean, in this case, I was wondering, uh, being part uh, of uh, the um, climate change uh, community, um, there are big risks because I think about fields like these where you also have some economical interest and also politics. And in our community, uh, we are uh, 100% sure that the origin of the climate change is anthropogenic. But if you talk with people, uh, that's not quite the proportion. So you have like uh, half and a half, maybe someone more people than you expect are really thinking for uh, uh, extra scientific reasons that the origin is not anthropogenic. So as a climate scientist, I, I was wondering how you deal with this kind of of risks when you have, uh, you know, uh, more different interests and also pseudoscience. You know, uh, when you have pseudoscientific thinking, uh, you have to deal with this in citizen science and how uh, you do this, for example, for this topic of climate change. Um, well, um, if we think at the level of interpretation of data, of course, uh, I think that the leadership should be inside from the scientific community, of course. Uh, then the, then uh, that there can be different interpretation of data. This is also part of the play uh, that we are called to discuss with our colleagues and with non-professional people, no, so to say. And uh, so long we, uh, we can use rational arguments. Um, and our arguments are strong enough no, to be uh, convincing. I think this is the only way that we can go no, to uh, um, also to educate. No, people not, not formed to scientific research um, on the way you know, that uh, it should be reflected, so to say, on, on the data. Uh, this is the example you know, in working together that can be uh, instructive. Educating and training is really one of the commonalities of uh, your approaches. Emily, do you want to complement? Yes, I, I uh, totally converge uh, with what Roberto has said. Um, if we take the example of these uh, assemblies again, um, during the, um, at the beginning of the, 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 the Paris climate assemblies, there were also some uh, climate uh, skeptics. But then we had this massive consensus at the, the very end. It means that when people get to work together for a long time, they feel listened to, they feel trusted, uh, they feel legitimate to voice their opinions, but they're also in the process of changing their opinions. They're actually getting to understand the science. These processes are really interesting because they are also forcing us scientists to speak in a more common language. And, and it's also breaking up the barriers between the scientists, you know, those who know and those who don't know. Right. And, and, and when you actually equalize 
there is a risk, right, that the, the people who don't know then take over. But then the benefit is actually you equalize and then they feel empowered and then they will take the time to actually learn. Uh, and you know, you have to put them in the right conditions to do so, but right to listen to others, listen to scientists. Scientists will make the very difficult steps to make their research results accessible to everyone, right? And, and then also listen, take the time to listen to what these uh, climate skeptics have to say and the reasons why they are not accepting the scientific results and they are not actually digesting them. Um, so um, to me, the only way to do this is to work together and to break down these barriers. It doesn't mean that we should not uh, study for 10 years that we should not be experts in our field and so on. But it also means that we have to learn to better communicate and, and that, that we also have to make the people we want to talk to feel that we respect them uh, and that, we, uh, and, and that they, they, they actually deserve our attention. And our, I know it's very hard you know, to speak in the media and so on. But that's also what we have to do, take these very difficult risks, <laughs> this risk and difficult uh, uh, situations into account and actually go there and, and, and uh, speak in, in simple words about what we know and, that, and what everybody should also know. Thank you very much.